Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 3, Episode 14, titled Cuba Libre. It originally premiered on January 23rd, 1987. It is directed by Virgil Vogel, who still has three episodes coming. So this isn't the only episode that this gentleman will, or this person will direct. Uh, but it is written by uh, Eric um, Estr... Yay? Yay. <laughs> <laughs> it is written by Eric Estrin and Michael Berlin. Who here is the only episode they ever wrote, and I'll think... Any of us are shocked by that. Or unhappy yeah. about it either. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say this this isn't my favorite episode by a stretch. But I think there's no coincidence that ending Zito's run in the two episode arc that was the saying goodbye to Zito, that that was a big moment in Miami Vice that he followed up with like, okay, now so I'll take a break. <sighs> Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's hard to follow up such a big two-part episode like that. But I mean, uh, swing and a miss, guys. <laughs> you could have tried a little bit harder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> before we get started, I can check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. Guys, I got something this week. If it was here. I mentioned it before. But you know what I did this week on, what day was that? Was that Wednesday? Wednesday. Wednesday. I showed up to a local event and I watched a fantastic show from the one and only bruce campbell so this is an 80s podcast how could i say no oh. to seeing bruce campbell live <laughs> I, I am so jealous i am the biggest bruce campbell fan i love the chin for years i watched burn notice take it or leave it how you feel about that show i will say i watched it almost exclusively for bruce campbell <laughs> yeah so for for the uninitiated shame on you first of all Second of all, you will recognize Bruce as the main protagonist, Ash, from the Evil Dead franchise, Army of Darkness. He was also Elvis and Bubba Hotep. So I'm sure, I'm sure if you're somebody, you have seen those movies. If you're not, please stop this podcast. Go put on one of those movies and watch that instead. Or his new show, yes. Ash vs. the Evil Dead. Yes. Yes, my new favorite yes. thing in the whole world. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's been fantastic, too. I mean, there's not a whole lot of stars shows that you go like, man, I I'm willing to pay for that. I can't wait you know, to but subscribe to their streaming service. <laughs> yes, but give them credit. Ash vs. the Evil Dead is fantastic. Uh, it is uh, just hilarious and falls right in line with everything Evil Dead. And, you know, the show, the live show was great. He did it as like a um, last fan standing. So if you've ever seen that show where it's like um, trivia about geek culture and stuff like that. So people from the crowd were involved or up on stage. He was calling on people in the crowd. We were here in Arizona, so of course he made some Sheriff Joe jokes. <laughs> uh, so all in all, it was fantastic. And I paid for the VIP package, and so I got to hang out afterwards. I got my book, Hail to the Chin, personalized by the man. You actually and got to talk to him. Got, got, I got to talk to him for a couple of minutes. Did you invite him for dinner? <laughs> I actually invited him out for drinks, but he wasn't listening. So it's just, <laughs> oh. Oh, yeah. Well, that was definitely better than this week's episode, so I'd love <laughs> to keep talking about how I met Bruce Campbell and got to see his live show. But I guess we're going to have to go over and talk about Cuba Libre. So let's go talk about this episode. So we open with a great flyover over Miami. I mean, it's almost like there was a second title scene. Like they had, we have so much flyover of Miami material. We have to squeeze it in more of them for every episode. We have to use it up, all right? <laughs> <laughs> there's a party going on at a mansion and there's hot dogs. Painted on the wall. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I think they're hot dogs, <laughs> that, which is weird because it's a very swanky party at that, you know. And I didn't see any them serving any hot dogs, so <laughs> just saying, it's kind of false advertising. You got a hot dog on your wall, but I don't see any hot dogs on your plate. Pigs in the blanket are strong appetizers. I, just, I, I, I know that's that's just high class. Missing, <laughs> yeah, just missing right out of the gate. <laughs> Yeah, and it's not the only weird things that are going on. The other weird thing is that everything's in slow motion. And we pan around the room, and Tubbs is there, and Crockett is dressed up like a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> a pirate waiter. 
It's a typical 80s party. It's full of pirates and cocaine. <laughs> Welcome to Miami. Yeah. <laughs> Tubs is sweaty, as usual. <laughs> the man that they do are waiting for for finally shows up. He's got women in both arms. Outside, a crew of armed men and women. Men and women, which is a first for Miami Vice here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they come pulling up ashore inside of an inflatable raft. They're in black garb, face ski masks, or they're wearing ski masks. One woman gets out of the black get up and is in a fancy dress and goes into the party. How do you guys crash a party? Um, <laughs> uh, me and my friends used to do that all the time. We would go in all of our getting camo gear and we would sneak up through the uh, ocean to get into these parties. <laughs> through the drain pipe. <laughs> <laughs> we know based on what we know from Miami, it may not be that weird because people who just show up in boats at your house okay but i want to know where she kept the heels where were those heels that she put on <laughs> she wasn't she was swimming in those she put them on she put, took off her jumpsuit had a beautiful sequin gown on she was an attractive woman Oops. and then she puts down her shoes she's like slips, sits down in shoes and puts in heels it's like where would you keep those <laughs> <laughs> well inside the duo step aside and they talk to someone named jerry pedroza he's from metro vice and he's there working Rojas, the same, the man that came walking in with the women in both arms. He's there working the same person. So two different vice teams in the same city are working the, the same person without talking to each other. You think they would have known that. You uh, think somehow they might work for the same actual police department. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, I just love that there's like this friendly competition between them. Like immediately, immediately it's like, oh, this is partner Tubbs, you know, and, and then basically the whole conversation basically goes, you guys suck, Metro. We're so <laughs> far ahead of you. We're so going to get this guy tonight. <laughs> we might let you help him, help us arrest him. That's what they tell him. <laughs> While they're talking, Rojas comes back in. He's got a couple glasses in his hand. He signals to Sonny and him and Tubbs go out to go talk to Rojas. Speaking of Armando Rojas, played by Willie Colon, who is actually a j jazz and salsa musician. He is a trombonist who has released over 40 albums, including an album with formerly of our music segment, Ruben Blades, which oh, won best-selling for the for the genre. Weird that there's a cro yeah. that there's some crossover there. Oh yeah, so and I guess he's I mean Willie Colon, I guess he's a pretty big deal as trombonist. Uh, well, I guess if you're able you know, to release I'm kind forty of a... albums as a trombonist, like you got to be like the best one that's out there. I mean, I think all of us only need one trombonist album in our life. He got forty of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Me as a jazz guy, I kind of recognize the name a little bit, but you know, I just I didn't realize 40 albums and, and just everything that came along with it. So he's actually kind of a big deal. Too bad he doesn't last very long in the episode. <laughs> no, because they immediately go upstairs and while they're up there negotiating, the armed people bust in. So the people who came ashore in the boat that were in black, they asked Rojas to open up the safe. Rojas like, there's no money in the safe, but that's not what they're there for. And downstairs, Jerry sees the woman. I don't know what causes, what triggers him. She like talking to her dress. Mm. He sees her like look down and like talking to her dress like she's got a microphone on and he's like, okay, that's, he's watching her. I, I thought he was just looking for the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> he goes upstairs and tries to get Sonny's attention. He's knocking the door saying that someone hit his, like scratched his car or something like that. And then one of the guards or one of the the attackers just shoots through the door and kills Jerry. Shootout starts as Rojas tries to open the safe. The attackers are running. Shooter kills, shoots and kills Rojas. Sonny shoots him. The rest of them get away, and we go to our opening credits. That's some opening, so, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and I noticed for all of the planning these guys took, the raft and the, all the black and having like this, you know, the plant with the uh, chick with the sequin dress and everything, with all the trouble they went through, um, they're not very good crooks. Uh, <laughs> they, 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 they didn't get into the safe. They didn't get the money. In fact, all they managed to do was kill an undercover cop and then run away. Yeah, they didn't accomplish anything they killed an undercover cop they killed rojas and then one of their own got shot and killed and they and they ran away like nothing nothing happened the only thing that yeah, happened that it, we it, knew was coming since when they introduced the character with his full name jerry pedroza like oh he's dead uh, he's dead 
<laughs> also because they're like competing with him. And also the key indicator that he was going to die was that Sonny said he trained him in procedures <laughs> at, <laughs> while he was in while he was like in school. He's like, uh-huh. I trained him at like, oh he's dead. <laughs> Sonny, you touched him, he's dead. Sorry. <laughs> Adam to the long list of former Sonny Croc partners that have died on the Yeah, uh, not even partners, it's like acquaintances that (laughs) if he Mm -hmm. had something to do with your career, you're dead. (laughs) (laughs) He is so close to getting that punch card filled up for the cemetery. (laughs) (laughs) When we come back from the opening credits, Stan is at the mansion. He's with the Miami PD and they're breaking into Rojas's trunk. Illegally. Yes, no warrant. At the precinct, the duo are running on the facts with Castillo. And it's, it looks like everyone who's anyone who's selling cocaine is doing business with Rojas. So it's really hard to tell who would be after him. They, would, they can't really point to someone like, oh, they, they have always had a problem with these people or something like that. But it was definitely a pro job. <laughs> Thanks, Sonny. (laughs) I'm going to continue to argue that fact. I don't believe it was a pro job. (laughs) Facts are. (laughs) In fact, I think we'll we'll get proof of the contrary further into the episode. (laughs) The phone rings and Trudy transfers a call from Stan. He found in the trunk of the car is $100,000. So the money that these criminals or these thieves or whatever you want to call them were after, that's where the money was, was in the trunk of the car, not inside the house, which comes back around Crockett saying Mm -hmm. that drug dealers don't keep the money in the house. So, Well, why didn't you say that before? (laughs) Before they shot Rose. You could have said that. (laughs) We head over to Metro Vice and the duo are talking to Jerry's partner who he seems to be upset but not that upset also why is he so old <laughs> i'm just saying he's really old is he pretending to be an undercover drug dealer too i just want to say that stan seeked out revenge for zito at no holds barred and not just to get re- not just to prove zito was innocent but also to make sure that the person who killed him w- got killed and he did it too like yeah, i you- mean he did he, he- uh-huh. Uh, legally, but he he, he killed him. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jerry's partner is sitting in the office filling out paperwork, thinking about who his next partner is going to be. Yeah, he's like, eh, I was supposed to go, but I couldn't because my I, wife just made curious. me stay home or something. I don't know. <laughs> is there something about cops where like it, it's a requirement to have like a partner die or a partner be set up by a bad guy or something? Like, is that like a requirement? It for, is for, for TV, clearly. To- <laughs> <laughs> Jerry's partner tells them that they had made contact with someone named Roki Flores that was a snitch that gave up R- Rojas. He hangs out at the Coconut Palms Country Club. So that's where the duo are off to to go talk to Roki. When they Roki, come, by the way, is a valet who's a little too rich for um, <laughs> being a fact that he parks cars for a living. So when we get to the Country Club <laughs> he, we, scene, we were so confused on this scene, Dominic. So like, confused. what is going on? Why are they taking him? To- What's going on? <laughs> so first of all, I-, I love the way the duo snatches them up. I mean, they, they roll up. He goes that because he's the valet. He goes to park the car. They pull him in and trap him into the middle seat and drive off with him. Just (laughs) kidnap him. (laughs) Take him out and just kind of scare the hell out of him. Where he spills the guts that he gave the Cuba Libre guys. Basically the whole breakdown of of the mansion. Like every room, every, 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 which... Of course, you know, your valet knows your property. <laughs> yeah, he said he drew him a diagram because he was for sure yeah. that no one was going to get hurt. Why did you die? Why would you draw them a diagram and think no one was going to get hurt? How was he? How it, how was he in there? How was he a part of Rojas? Like, I don't know. He didn't I, say I don't that. Know. He never said like how he knows of everything about it. He just said like, I drew him. I even told knows, him where the safe was. <laughs> yeah, he knows everything about Rojas's house, which makes sense because my valet comes in my house all the time. He's like <laughs> part of the family. Really? Yeah. Um, at this point. Uh, but here's my question. The valet knows every corner of this guy's house, including where the safe is, does not know that he keeps his money in the trunk of the car he parks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Know your job, okay? Know your role. You at least need to know what's in the trunk yes. of the car. You park his car and you've never looked in the trunk? But you know where oh, his oh, safe okay. is. <laughs> now the duos have no what, what to do. So, of course, they're going to protect the valet, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no. <laughs> he gives up two names, Zamora and Vasquez. 
Victor Vasquez catches the duo's attention. So that was the end here. Like he says, Victor Vasquez. And then Tubbs and Crockett kind of look at each other in the corner of their eyes like, oh, no, Victor (laughs) Vasquez. As if we're all supposed to know who Victor Vasquez is. It's an inside joke, okay? (laughs) Between the two of them. (laughs) They head back to the precinct that the duo are talking to Trudy. No info on Vasquez or Zamora. They're protected behind at the courthouse. They can't get any information because they're protected with diplomatic immunity or something like that, right? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. I don't know. I checked out. I don't know. Something to do with the feds. (laughs) The the feds are investigating them or he's like a key witness for them or I don't know. It's another episode where for some reason there's a federal agent who just does not like his job and then crockett runs out and asks stan like hey <laughs> hey you have an ex-girlfriend that used to Sorry. work at personnel at the courthouse right maybe because we can't get through here legally maybe you could illegally go ask the court to give you information on vasquez Just and Zamora. as a friend not illegally no, <laughs> yeah you know and then we'll use that as part of our investigation just yeah. go just go ask and stan's There's, like uh-uh uh-uh he's like well no, uh, I, I don't wanna no he says like he can he's like i can but i have to tell you something <laughs> <laughs> Turns out Roberta was Robert. Yeah. Sunny and Stan don't seem like they care. You know, like yeah. it's that Sunny's happens. Like, Whatever, cool. Sunny's like, well, you can't talk to her as friends. Yeah. I'm not asking you to bang Roberta. <laughs> I just want you to get information from That's the That's what courthouse. I do, not you, okay? <laughs> I bang everybody for information. Poor Stan. Loses his count and has to start counting all the damn cash over again. Yeah. No one is considered in this police station. The duo then go into Castillo's office and they talk to Castillo and a man named Jack Slade, who says he's with the feds, who says that Victor Vasquez, that he worked with Victor Vasquez, he's important to the feds. He was even part of the Bay of Pigs invasion in Cuba. So he is a protected Cuban in the United States. He is off limits. There not to do any investigation into him. Castillo steps in and says, you don't tell my people what to do. This is our job. Someone is dead. Two people are dead. Yeah, a crime was committed in our city. It's mm-hmm. our job to investigate mm-hmm. it. And I'm starting to believe in you again, Castillo. He says, we're going to do our jobs. Yeah. And I don't care what you say. And Slade tries to say, hey, you should understand this. You're a former Fed. You used to work for the CIA. Castillo's not hearing it. We're doing our investigation. So... <clears throat> We get Castillo the Decider again. We haven't seen Castillo the Decider in recent episodes. I've missed him. Yeah, well, where was he? Where was he when Larry was dead? Where See, were you he deciding just didn't that? Care. Huh? Yeah, he did. That was care. a whole lot of not That's his what... problem. It was a whole lot of not clearly, home, but now he's he back. He never the liked Larry. Respect. That's what this is all about. He never liked Larry <laughs> and his fish. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> help that Larry's a drug addict. <laughs> and an alcoholic. No. <laughs> I'm sorry, Larry. He did you so wrong. Castillo also says, don't sign your reports that give him to Castillo. Then he will sign them as if it's coming from him. And Tubbs is like, we could take the heat. <laughs> Why are you chumping around all over? <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> I didn't watch the episode, well, so I have to play us like a couple chumps. We can sign our own paperwork. <laughs> I didn't really pay attention to the episode, so I have to add what I can, and I just know that that's what that's what Tubbs would say. <laughs> Out at Vasquez's boat, Sonny calls. He wants to meet up with him to talk business. Vasquez says, "Come alone." He hangs up the phone and then immediately calls Zamora and says that there's a problem. Later, when Sonny shows up, Vasquez and Zamora are there. Now, this is an interesting tactic that the team is taking here. Sonny is saying that he was basically burned by Cooper. So Cooper had done the deal with Rojas. He has all this extra money because Rojas got killed. So he's got the money and the drugs. So he's looking to launder the money. Sonny Burnett is helping him do that, but he doesn't really like Cooper. So he wants to take his money and then his finder fee for the money would be 20%. So he's trying to set Cooper up here. Which actually is not a bad yeah, idea. I, like, this is one of the better ideas they've had. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh-huh. Well, for once, they're, put, so they're not putting an innocent person at risk. They're actually, one of them is, is taking the heat. So, And I get it. Uh, I, I don't like Cooper much either. He always pretends to be Jamaican. <laughs> guy's annoying. <laughs> that Cooper, he changes what he is all the time, too. Sometimes he's not Jamaican. Huh? <laughs> Sonny leaves and 
Zamora talks to Vasquez. Zamora is happy to take it, Cooper's money. He's not going to stop this from happening. But Vasquez is really concerned about his family. Should it throw up a red flag that they just shot at, at Burnett while trying to rob Rojas? And then now he wants to do business with them? Like, yeah, I should know. Should that bother them at all? Like, huh, we almost killed this guy. He killed one of our guys. Um, but let's do business with him. Yeah, it's just water under the bridge. He, they got other guys back there. They see, You see how many people they have working for him? <laughs> they just replace them. <laughs> Vasquez is played by Ishmael Carlo. He's just an epic TV act. Crime story, first season. He was on General Hospital for two seasons. Cold Case for five episodes. What's cool about Ishmael Carlo is that he served in the Army for 17 years. And then after serving in the Army, he took a job as a janitor at a theater. And that was what broke him in the act. He was working as a janitor. Editor and they used him in one of the productions and uh there you go he's an actor wow that's pretty cool like, actually yeah, like just, he just gets the job and then just happens to be around like a rags to riches kind of yeah wow yeah exactly when Sonny gets back into his car he gets a call from tubs tubs is on site and tubs is telling Sonny that flores is dead and it looks like it was a pro job so john to answer your question is is the vice team going to give flores protection the answer is Standard protection. <laughs> yes. They told he him to watch his out. last car. Yeah. Just be careful. Watch out. Check your surroundings before you go outside. That's what we can offer you. <laughs> <laughs> At the precinct, the dealer are talking to Castillo. It was definitely a pro job. Gina comes in and she says that the prints and the bullets from the gun match a military hit. And then Castillo also lets drop that Slade personally blocked the request for money, the $400,000, I think it was, or yeah, something, something along those lines, like personally blocked their request for money. Now, this is where Castillo, the decider, comes back in, John. He says, since we can't get the money, go ahead and use the money that was from Rojas's trunk. And even Tubbs is shocked. He's like, but that hasn't been entered yeah. in as evidence yet. And he's like, yep, but no. This will cost you your badge if something happens. Yeah. And I love it. And I love this Castillo. This this Castillo so bold, he's going to use money that hasn't even been entered into evidence. I do just want to throw out there. I don't think this is the first time they've ever used money from a one drug deal <laughs> no. during an episode. <laughs> it's not. I, Remember they take that up. Ep- they're the episode where they take the money from Gina and Trudy. They're like doing that sting on that professor in the it's hotel the room. It's the Uncle Polly episode. Yeah, and they, and they take the money from that. Let's pretend like this is a big deal because Castillo's betting his badge on it. You know, <laughs> um, let's not muddle this up. The fact that they've done this a few times, uh, <laughs> even without with Sonny just doing it on his own without permission. So now this is when we get the first sense of what's happening, what Zamora is up to. We go out to this training ground. It's a very elaborate setup on one of the islands that's out in the Keys because they end up doing a bus at the end of this on Key Biscayne. So it's, it's definitely out in the Keys, like their own island. And they're running around throwing grenades, shooting automatic weapons all over the place. How does no one know what the hell was happening out here? How are there so many islands, too? Like, they keep going to all these different islands or stuff. <laughs> They're in the jungle, Dominic. Yeah, things, I know. <laughs> uh, things that happen in the jungle stay in the jungle. Nobody lives on these islands, clearly, and so they can't see it. <laughs> They're blowing Cuban shit Cuban revolutionaries, D. <laughs> they shoot a rocket launcher and blow up a car. How does no one know? There's something wrong out here. Maybe they think it's like when we lived in Washington, where John lives. <laughs> we, they used to blow stuff up every night. Remember when we first moved there? We we're like, oh my God, we're going to die. What is going on? <laughs> Unfortunately, they literally fire bombs over my house periodically. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Just, just everyday life, bombs exploding and shaking my walls. Just, just, you know, and it, it wouldn't be bad. It wouldn't be bad. It'd actually be kind of cool if it wasn't at like three o'clock in the morning sometimes. Because <laughs> yeah. apparently. Vasquez is saying that this is all getting too complicated. I think if you looked around, you'd realize <laughs> this is getting too complicated. It's Not just too the much. deal with Burnett. <laughs> yeah. It, no, it can't be too complicated. They are very well coordinated. So well coordinated because Paco Zamora's lieutenant, played by Artie Molesky, is actually a stuntman and stunt director of over 80 movies, including Miami Vice the movie. <laughs> he knows what's <laughs> happening in the future. <laughs> yes. 
Zamora says he's going to do the deal with Burnett. He basically just wants revenge for Cuba, and he just wants his money. But this is when Vasquez really lays into him. Like, you ain't even ever been to Cuba. Yeah, what do you, you mean <laughs> take care of your home Cuba? You don't even know what you're talking about. And it's all blows up a car. Uh, and they keep alluding to something that's going to happen in two days. For some reason, this is all going to happen before Tuesday. Because um, maybe he's got court or jury duty or something. I, 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 I kept wondering, what's well, going to happen in two days? Come on, guys, spill it. Tell me, tell me. <laughs> so now Vasquez is going to go make a visit to Burnett. He heads out to Sonny's boat. Sonny's sleeping. He's, well, I would say sleeping, but he's fully clothed, so he probably passed out. That's probably <laughs> more realistic of our Sonny Crockett. And he wakes up to someone walking around on his boat. He gets out his gun. He sticks his head out, and he turns and looks, and he sees that it's Vasquez. This is when Sonny explains the whole Cooper story. He goes into more detail about why he's doing this, why he's setting up Cooper, and he gets his 20%. Vasquez says he's got two days to get this done. Otherwise, they're out, and then he leaves. At the precinct, they're doing a review on who Vasquez is. He's a resistance fighter in Cuba. He is a, They show a picture of him with Slade. So him and Slade are really close, not just that he helps with the Bay of Pigs, but he helps with the Bay of Pigs specifically with Slade. And Obviously, Sonny and everyone else in the room knows that Vasquez is up to something else, that there's so- something else here, not just cocaine, at, like what this started as. Castillo says it doesn't fit with what Vasquez is, though, because they've seen his file now. They know that that's not like the the greater invasion or whatever have you that Sonny's thinking that Vasquez is up to. It just doesn't fit who he is. But he says, go ahead and go with it, though. Like, go do your investigation. Use Rojas's cash to do the setup and use the safe house out of Coral. Minimal backup because Sonny is concerned that Vasquez will sniff it out. So he's kind of out there all by himself. So this is when we really start to speed up here. And we're going to get like this episode really does ramp up as we get closer to the end because Sonny, it turns out, is going to be in way over his head. Vasquez takes Sonny yeah. out t- to the training ground. K- and- kind of. <laughs> there, things get really interesting you know i mean i think it, it, it picks up because the whole thing starts to go down at the same time i think we see a little bit more of of that these guys just don't know what the hell they're doing <laughs> vasquez takes sunny out to the compound and sunny expects to go out to his boat and that's kind of what this whole thing is banking on is that cooper is going to show up at his boat and there's going to be this deal and yada 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 but now they're taking a totally different direction. And it's the land of no cell phones. So he's not able to tell Castillo and Tubbs and Stan that how things are changing. Welcome to the jungle, kid. <laughs> later, so they show up at this compound. Sonny goes into a room. And then later that night, so he's there for a long time. Like, like They're just holding him prisoner there? I guess. It's like he moved in there. I don't know. <laughs> Spending the weekend there. <laughs> Staying for dinner, apparently. At some point during the time they're hanging out, just to find out little bits about the plan. They plan on murdering Cooper. So the resistance plan is to murder the Cuban deputy commissioner of prisons for what they're doing to the resistance fighters inside of Cuba. He happens to be in Miami, so they're going to kill him in revenge for all the political prisoners that Castro is locked up. And what's great about it is that Zamora is standing around this fire and he's using this pointer and he's pointing at what is like a shooting target, but explaining that they're going to kill the deputy commissioner of prisons. (laughs) (laughs) I want you to shoot him in the 50 point range. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Vasquez then talks to Zamora and they're still arguing. Vasquez isn't on the same page as Zamora. Vasquez says that vengeance isn't worth it. So whatever you're doing, it's not worth it. Back at the precinct, Stan is sh- showing Tubbs the briefcase. It'll have a beacon in it. Castillo walks up nervous and says that Cat Crockett hasn't checked in. He was supposed to call three hours ago. And Tubbs just like, yeah, no. <laughs> I haven't talked to him either. No. <laughs> yeah. who, who cares? Crockett's on his own. Uh, you know. <laughs> It makes you wonder if, if Tubbs is thinking like, eh, Crockett dies, then, you know, at least I don't have to ride in a car with him anymore. <laughs> or a boat. The important thing, though, is that he knows that he has to show up with the money. Otherwise, they will kill Sonny. So he's just going to do what he's supposed to do. He's going to go out to the safe house at Coral and wait for Sonny and Zamora and Vasquez to show up. 
Zamora's men show up at the meet, and Crockett is trying. So they they show up to the house on Coral. Tubbs actually hiding outside, and so Stan in in the van. They're both outside hiding. Crockett is trying to convince them to wear masks, otherwise Cooper will recognize them. They'll lead Cooper to Burnett to know that he's the one that set up this deal. And Zamora just kind of winks. It's like we don't need masks because Cooper's not going to make it out of this alive. Yeah, and Crockett's like, yeah, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I rushed it a minute ago. This is when they, they say that Cooper is going to die. It, you know, my thought was, well, you know, Vice uh, probably should have thought of that, you know. And then, <laughs> then my, my second thought was, well, how did Cooper know to hide in the bushes? He just sensed like, huh, someone's going to shoot me. I better go hide. <laughs> um, no, he knew because Crockett didn't call in. He knew there was something wrong. When they talked at the precinct, they were like, he's like, okay, I'll do, I'll proceed with caution, basically. But I have to go. Because if I don't go, they're going to kill him. So he knew something was up. That's why he was waiting in the bushes. But this leads me to evidence number one, that these guys are terrible at their jobs. <laughs> so, also, like, uh, how are Sunny you Marks. safer in the bushes? Why don't you, like, hide? The, the doors just don't open the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, they can yeah. shoot so, you in the bush. So they show up. <laughs> they show up. And unlike a trained army, they don't check the perimeter, so they don't find Stan and uh, and Tubbs hiding in the bushes, 10 feet away from the door. They show up three hours early, and Crockett's even like, hey guys, we're a little early. He might not even be here yet. They're like, oh, who cares? <laughs> and then they, they're just they go gonna... in there, he's not there, and they're like, oh well. <laughs> we'll wait around for him. <laughs> it's hard to look yeah. like they're just going to kill Burnett. And he remembers, oh, that's right. Drug dealers don't keep their money in the house. They keep it in the car. So they go out and there it is. The money's in the trunk. Zamora's men grab the briefcase. And they take off, but the vice is in tow because they have the beacon on the briefcase. And they got to get that money back because <laughs> Casillo's going to lose his job. <laughs> so this is the second time that they have done a full on operation and almost had to leave without any money at all. If, if Crockett doesn't go, hey, dealers keep the money in the trunk, these guys sit around and twiddle their thumbs for three <laughs> hours and go home. True. Yeah, they're not very good at getting money. So <laughs> who's funding all this then? <laughs> all the, how yeah, they buy all these things to blow all the up? Training about? Yeah, what is all the training about? <laughs> they're practicing throwing grenades and all this stuff, and they can't they can't manage to rob a single drug dealer correctly? <laughs> We have a quick scene where Slade is talking to Vasquez, and Vasquez is extremely mad at Slade. But Slade, what you get the sense here is that Slade is crooked. He's just in this for the money. He's given up on being the good guy fighting the Cuban resistance, um, or fi sorry, fighting Cuba and Castro and being part of the feds. He's just in this for the money. Obviously, we've never seen this before. A dirty federal agent. <laughs> uh, such a new thing, the vice, uh, you know, a Fed being dirty. I'm starting um, to think there is no clean I, federal agents in <laughs> Miami. <laughs> I, I am pretty, uh, pretty ambulous. I, I, I think that they are all dirty. If Slade was smart, he would have tried to pin all of this on Crockett. Because <laughs> everyone thinks Crockett's crooked anyway, right? He already is crooked. Well, and they, I mean, and he no one proved him innocent in that whole episode where he yeah. kills the crooked cop out on the boat all by himself. He's not crooked. Yeah, <laughs> the, the pirate episode proved that that was the way because it almost worked. It would have worked had he not gone out on the boat with Crockett. Which yeah, was just true. a dumb yeah. decision. <laughs> yeah, that was stupid. His plan had already worked. He already had the money. He didn't need to get on the boat. But I, I don't know. That was... <laughs> That was a, a whole season ago, John. Let yes. it go, okay? Let I'm not at all bitter or... or <laughs> I, I, I'm not bitter or still angry that we have no resolution about the pirates <laughs> that are trying to kill Crockett. <laughs> That's what you're angry about? Not angry that Tubbs has a son floating around and we can't find him? There are pirates actively trying to kill Crockett, <laughs> and we have never discussed it. It is just a non-factor. <laughs> because they're trying to kill Burnett, okay? <laughs> Not Crockett. <laughs> Well, inside the van where they have Sonny and the money, they are transferring the money to a new bag. And you start to see Sonny is getting real nervous now. They throw the briefcase with the beacon out of the van. So now he, has any, he doesn't have any backup. He's stuck with these lunatics who are armed to the teeth. And they already said they wanted to kill Cooper. So why wouldn't they just kill him? I mean, they kind of give that impression. Too, where he starts him, yeah. getting nervous. And they're like, well, you're not going to make it out of this either. 
because Sonny says that he doesn't want to carry eighty thousand dollars back with him, like just walk with it. And Zamora's like, "Well, you ain't gonna make it back." So <laughs> yeah, who said you're going anywhere? <laughs> <to it? laughs> As they start to pull up to Vasquez and Slade, Sonny sees that Slade is there, and that's when he's like, "Okay, everything about this is crooked because now I see the Fed." is involved with this he grabs the steering wheel causes it to crash and gets out and runs away and this is this is my favorite sunny moment ever even more so than him rolling around at the shooting range no it can't be better than that it's better than this because sunny does his best john rambo impression out in the jungle <laughs> dude that was i thought the same thing i was like oh son crockett's going all rambo he's gonna run out into the jungle and set booby traps and <laughs> <laughs> He's out there making bows and arrows <laughs> with tree branches. Oh, oh yeah, like, hides in the bushes and he like comes out the stick and he beats him up. He takes his gun, but then Vasquez is right behind him. He's like, oh, <laughs> oh, sure. He, he's, he's not a very good Rambo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, come on, this fish alone. You can't live up to that. <laughs> the, the exchange he has with Vasquez too is great because Vasquez is, is basically tells him like, I'm giving you a pass. Just do this one thing for me and save my family. And so he's like, no dice, shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't save families, shoot me. <laughs> Screw your family, just shoot me and get it over with. <laughs> Vasquez is like, I, like pleading with him, like, I don't want to kill you. I'm going to let you go <laughs> to save my family. So he's like, no deal. <laughs> So he does eventually run off and he's going to head out to the compound after the Brigada leaves. So he runs off and gets to a payphone. He calls Tubbs and tells him that something bad is going down tonight. <laughs> he's like, a what? <laughs> what would he have done now? Nowadays, you could never run to a payphone. He'd just be screwed. He'd be stuck on that island. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, have, I have actually encountered a few times in which I desperately needed some kind of phone, like a payphone or something. Um, I will tell you, most businesses won't let you use their telephone. No. Nope. <laughs> um, oh, I walked for a while. And eventually, a car dealership was nice enough to allow me to use their telephone. So just going to throw this out there. Public service announcement. If someone needs to use your phone in your business, use your damn phone. It's Did you buy a, a car? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Did they get you to buy a car? Make a local that? call. <laughs> I, I'm not calling. I'm not calling 900 numbers. I mean, you can stand right there and listen. I don't care. I just need to make a phone call, guys. <laughs> the key here is that Sonny says this all has to be done without Slate. So Stan and Tub swing by, they pick up Sonny, they head back out to the compound. Can, can I ask you guys something? So when when Crockett's talking to Castile on the phone when he's at the fo phone booth, Trudy's standing right next to Castile while he's talking on the phone. And the whole time she is writing on this notepad feverishly, just writing all these notes. And I am just curious, what do you think she was writing? <laughs> was she dictating the conversation? Was he on speaker and he was just hold and Castillo was just holding the receiver to his ear for fun? Um, <laughs> she's got to be. She's got to be writing down whatever Castillo says. He, he's like repeating back what Crockett said. She's doodling. She's drawing him a stick is figure that, of Castillo with a big old mustache. <laughs> <laughs> is that really a good use of Trudy's time? Is to yeah, stand around, and stand <laughs> with Castillo. And, 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 and write down everything he says on the phone. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know that if you could be authorized as a police officer in the city of Miami, then you become a secretary. Yeah, well, maybe she was going to like yeah. run away, like run off, like get the information out quickly. And then he was going to stay on the phone. And she was like, I got to go. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> She's got other things to do. She's got to go type up reports and stuff. The, she, the secretary during the conversation, she wrote like three pages worth of notes. Like, I got to know what was on there. Maybe they're her own personal notes. Stan and Tubbs give the details of the Vasquez Slade relationship in the van to Sonny. And it boils down to that Slade had set up the Bay of Pigs invasion, but then like almost purposefully ruined it. Like he fumbled it so bad that Vasquez even submitted a formal complaint. So they have problems. Slade has been crooked for years. I also want to introduce a new term. And it's it it makes me feel bad, but it makes me feel good at the same time. We have no more Zito, which all which means that we don't have the duo in the B team. It also means that we're gonna have 
Stan rolling around with Tubbs and Crockett all the time. So I'm gonna start referring to them when they're three together as the as the Musketeers. No. no. <laughs> okay. No. I get that on that. I want the B team. I, I, did did hey. you notice how the Musketeers did not slow the van down as they were picking no. up Crockett either? <laughs> they made his ass run and jump in. We are not even gonna touch the brakes. <laughs> run, sucker. <laughs> Then when the Musketeers show up to the compound, they knock out a couple of people and they do save the Vasquez family, who looks suspicious of their rescue. <laughs> oh, I was like, what? I thought you meant the family. Those no. damn shady ass kids. <laughs> they look suspicious. That old lady. Like, that old lady looked like she was up to no good. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what do you mean? They're like regular family. <laughs> No, I mean that they're just suspicious of the Musketeers. Yeah, because they don't know who these people are. Like, what? <laughs> so somehow a plan is formed, and and somehow one of them, and I missed this, somehow one of them ends up in the limo. So Sonny calls Castillo and says that the gorillas are going to hit a limo where the diplomat is heading down 107 on Key Biscayne. Can't be more exact than that, though, which seems pretty exact. That's going to be somewhere on Key Biscayne on this certain freeway. Key Biscayne can't be that big. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's only like 10 miles wide. Huh? <laughs> Trudy tells Castillo that the limo's already left from the airport, so they can't call the limo, without the, especially without the feds knowing. So they may have a car phone, but the feds will know. So, I mean, Slade will know. But it's going to be an international incident. So Castillo says, call a meeting with SWAT, ask Sonny how far away they are. Like, we are going to move it, move in on this without notifying anyone on the fence, even though this is going to be a huge international incident if something like this happens. So then we head out to Key Biscayne, and Zamora's men so, are set. So is anyone going to call Metro? Didn't they <laughs> promise this guy's partner he could be involved in this? He did. They did. He, like said, he said, Can I, I, all I want to do is I want to be there when you arrest them. <laughs> Whoops. I just, I, I, I feel like Metro is being left out of this. There, there's a guy who might want revenge. I don't know. Well, he didn't want it Poor bad Metro. enough. So he could have been involved in this all along. He's lazy. <laughs> if he wanted to be more involved, he shouldn't have gotten married. Uh, during, or he shouldn't have had an anniversary during the original party. Yeah, exactly. What kind of cop is he taking off his anniversary? <laughs> Not dedicated. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So out at Key Biscayne, Zamora's men are set. Slade runs off with his cut of the money. Obviously, his role was to tell the guerrillas when the diplomat was going to be in town. The limo is heading down the freeway. The Miami PD are racing to get there as fast as they can. Stan and the Miami PD stop Slade, which I have a big question here. How do they know he's going to be driving down this dirt road? Because it I wasn't a know. paved road. It was a dirt road that Slade was driving down. And then they <laughs> arrest him. <laughs> I don't know. There's lots of questions like, how do they not know Slade was crooked from the beginning? <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> As the limo gets closer, the Miami PD show up just in time. They pop out of the bushes. Brief shootout and the gorillas give up. But Zamora... Rolls away with a rocket launcher. <laughs> he rolls away. <laughs> Literally rolls away with a rocket yes. launcher. <laughs> Vasquez gets <laughs> shot, too. He goes down. Zamora then gets on one knee, aims for the limo. Sorry, he doesn't have a rocket launcher. He has just a regular gun. He opens fire. Why am I thinking he has a rocket launcher? I think he fires the rocket no. launcher and misses. Oh, he has a rocket launcher. This is So this is the part that was confusing for me. But somehow Sonny is now driving the limo and Zamora has the bazooka and he misses with a bazooka <laughs> and then Sonny pops out and shoots him. And I'm confused at how all this transpires, <laughs> including how do you miss with a bazooka? <laughs> what was all the training for? <laughs> he didn't train on a bazooka, clearly. <laughs> they only had the one bazooka. This is why they screwed they up the Bay of on, Pigs. They only trained on stationary cars. <laughs> Not ones that were moving. <laughs> These guys are terrible crooks. And what was going to happen if he did hit it then? Like, Sonny was just going to blow up. <laughs> <laughs> the dude will get out and shoot and kill Zamora. Then later that evening... Castillo shows up with the Vasquez family. Vasquez is hurt, but he's not dead. His wife, Yolanda, comes running over, and Vasquez tells Yolanda it's finally over, 
And then the episode ends. And you're like, what's over? <laughs> that's it? Uh, that's that's all you get? Not just that. Not just that. So Vasquez goes, it's all over. It's finally over. And then there's the most ominous music played before the credits <laughs> roll. <laughs> like, dun, dun, dun. It's and not credits. over. <laughs> or is like, it? Is it? <laughs> Yeah, is it not over? Is I don't there know. another person with a bazooka hiding in a bush? I don't know. Don't worry, they're terrible aim. They'll never hit you with that bazooka. <laughs> Victor Vasquez, the the Ismael Carlo who plays Victor Vasquez, is going to reappear in the episode Hard Knocks. I would say like, well, maybe he's going to come back as Victor Vasquez, but he's not. He's going to nope. play Chichi Rodriguez. <laughs> yep. So, what was with the um, music, Vice? <laughs> and they didn't know he was going to come back at that time. <laughs> hey, I understand where this episode comes from because it's a rip from the headlines when it comes to the Cuban resistance and the very anti-Castro movement that was happening in the United States. But, but, we make a lot of leaps here in this episode. There's a lot of things that don't make a whole lot of sense. And... A lot of things, like, it would have been nice to see how the duo caught up to the limo and convinced the Cuban diplomat that he was about to get murdered and yeah, why they should take there. over for the limo. Like, things like that. It would be yes. cool to see those kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm always a little put off when the bad guys are completely incompetent. And we have seen multiple times in this episode that they have gone with extreme planning and big guns and military supposed military training and not achieve the same thing. They couldn't rob a drug dealer. <laughs> they had to have Crockett show him where the money was. And then he misses with a bazooka trying to kill the one guy they've been trying to kill <laughs> the entire time. John can't get off the bazooka. <laughs> the bazooka is going to stay with him. A bazooka? <laughs> and they practice so much. <laughs> well, let's go talk about this week's music because there is a classic rock god. <laughs> You're like, really thinking about how to say that. <laughs> there is a classic rock god on this week's music segment. So let's go over and talk about the music. All right, John, I have to say, with my hair longer now, I'm not shaving into a buzz cut anymore. I'm actually kind of thinking about getting a Bob Seger haircut. So I kind of want to hear more about the man before oh, yeah? I make that decision. <laughs> 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 All right, so I'm going to save him for the, for, for the end. Let's talk a little bit about the other two songs first. So let's talk about Gun Law by Kang Gang. Kang Gang was a pop trio from Northeast England from 1982 to 1991. They were composed of Martin Brammer and Paul Woods on vocals and Dave Brewis on instrumentals. They released two albums, 1985's Bad and Low Down World of the Kang Gang and 1987's Miracle. Uh, 1987's Miracle would feature their only top 40 hit and number one dance song, Don't Look Any Further, which is actually a cover of a Dennis Edwards song. Uh, who Dennis Edwards is? I don't know. <laughs> but apparently it's good to dance to. <laughs> So they broke up in 1991. Woods and Brewis would go on to have a would go on would go out into a solo career. I, I guess they were mildly successful, but I don't really feel like they were hugely successful solo. Brammer, though, he would actually be successful writing songs for other artists like Tina Turner and Sheena Easton. So he co-wrote Sheena Easton's song Time Bomb and Tina Turner's song Open Arms, among others. I point out those two artists specifically because I didn't recognize any of the other artists. The group Kang Gang, named after the movie Citizen Kang. I really Let's hope that they perform with a whole bunch of sleds. <laughs> Rosebud. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty much the extent of uh, they existed. That That's pretty much them. <laughs> Let's get even more abstract, guys. We have I Feel Like Holding On by G Gwen Majors. Why is that abstract? Because the song was released as a 12-inch single only. The version w that was actually aired was recorded by Amy Holland. Amy Holland, by the way, is the daughter of country singer Esmeralda an opera singer, Harry Borsma, and she's actually the wife of Michael McDonald. Yeah. That is crazy. So, yeah, and so her debut album was produced by Michael McDonald. She is also his backup singer on most of his albums. Gwen Majors, by the way, born in Martinez, California, and lives in L.A. She 
according to her Facebook, is a Soul Street song stylist and owns her own indie indie label. I don't know if that is the same Gwen Majors, but that was the only Gwen Majors I could find. So I mean, that feels uh, I did very find it coincidental kind of that it would be I could it'd be weird that I was a different person. I just want to make sure I understand here correctly. You're saying that the song that's in the episode is by Gwen Majors. But it, the one the version in the episode wasn't performed by her. It was performed by someone else. Yes. So <laughs> trust me, I tried looking it up. It comes up as the song comes up as Gwen Majors. But according to what I was at, what I uh, when I was looking it up, it was actually recorded by Amy Holland, the wife of Michael McDonald. Weird. Gwen Majors not very uh, did not has not had a very successful career, being that it was only ever recorded on a twelve inch single, <laughs> and. All I could find was a Facebook uh, <laughs> that she has. And the Gwen Majors I found, like I said, strange enough, born in Martinez, California, where me and Dominic were actually raised. Which is That's crazy. Funny. <laughs> we might know her. <laughs> hey, Gwen. So let's get to Bob Seger, the man, the legend. Bob Seger's song, Miami, was at the beginning of the episode. Bob Seger, a musician from 1961 to now, he started out, first band was the Decibels. He, he would play with them for a while, and he would, he, this is going to be the session of Bob Seger before he really actually breaks out. He would play for the de- play with the Decibels. He would then change uh, and join a band called the Town Criers. He would then join the Doug Brown and the Omens band. He would do a little bit of studio work, but not but not really be recognized for anything. He would then create and the Last Herd. Eventually, they would change the name of the Last Herd to the Bob Seger System. Then he would have a regional hit of the song. The Rambling Gambling Man, which would make it to number 17, the Bob Seger set, uh, which, on a side note, would be the first studio gig and to Bob Seger then friend, Glenn Fry, before <laughs> the guitarist would make it big with the Eagles. Wow. And it turns out they've been friends for quite a long time. Some of those bands I mentioned, Glenn Fry was in. Uh, the Bob Seger system would last from 19... 19- 68 to 1971 before they would break up. Bob Seger would go solo for three years before settling on the Silver Bullet Band. Silver Bullet Band would th- would be when he started to turn out the hit. You would have hits like Turn the Page, Night Moves, which is probably my favorite one. I love Night Moves. And Old Time Rock and Roll, also made famous because Tom Cruise would lip sync it in his underwear in the movie Risky Business. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we've all seen that moment. I would prefer to remember Tom Cruise is always running, but there's that too. Yes, so but that is one of the scenes that is most recreated in pop culture. As Seeger's career would start to unfold, and those hits would would start, uh, he would start to become famous. He would collaborate again with Glenn Frey and the Eagles co-writing the song Heartache Tonight. Wow. Okay. All right. I yeah. actually like this crossover between Seeger and the Eagles, too. Yeah. He would also eventually release the song Like Her Rock, which if you've ever seen a Chevy commercial during a football game, you know the song very well. Other songs of his that you might recognize from pop culture, Understanding from the movie Teachers, and Shakedown from Beverly Hills Cop 3, which Beverly Hills Cop 3, by the way, makes an appearance in a lot of Vice stuff. There's got to be a connection somewhere. Yeah, there's somehow. a lot of crossover there. Going into the 90s, Bob Seger would eventually kind of f- fade away. Uh, music would move into the grunge scene and other things, and people just did not get down on that old-time rock and roll anymore. Seger would take some time, some time with family, and take a break from touring altogether until uh, into the he would end up releasing his greatest hits album. And then in the 2000s, he would be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2004 and begin touring again after releasing the album Face the Promise. Since then, he has continued to tour periodically and been kind of somewhat successful. But that that's pretty much it. I mean, I, I did not realize going into this that Bob Seger, well, one, was friends with Glenn Fry. I had such a connection to the Eagles. I also kind of expected a little more, how do I say, rock and roll-esque yeah, stuff. You, you know? always get the sense, because you've never heard anything about Bob Seger, other than just you know, he tours, he makes music. And, you know, I am I like Bob Seger. I'm, I'm not... There's a lot of people who really don't like Bob Seger music. And I know that you guys, like John, you mentioned Night Moves and Melissa's over here shaking her head. Like, yes, Night Moves is a great song. That's like the only song 
that I like from a I also moment. love Against the Wind. Yeah, it's a good song. So, But I'm with you. I expected like, okay, now we're going to get into the deep, dirty stuff about Bob Seger. He's got such a pristine, clean personality in the media. Now we're going to get into the good stuff. And it kind of sounds like, no, he's no, he's just kind of good. Like, yeah, no, that's I, just him. Yeah. <laughs> he's squeaky clean. I mean, I, I guess was married a couple times, but nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. I mean, your normal rock star marriages, nothing, nothing that jumps off the page, you know, no drug addictions, no breaking the law, no being banned in other countries, <laughs> no stealing from uh, David Bowie. Like, nothing. <laughs> it's the first time I can say. Music went didn't go to a weird place. <laughs> there was no weirdness. I still think I might know Gwen Majors. Gwen, if you're out there, hit me up on Facebook. <laughs> well, let's go talk about our final thoughts on this episode because I think there's some strong feelings here. Let's uh, let's go close this one out. All right, Melissa, I'd like you to kick us off this week on what your final thoughts are on this episode. Well, they're going to be short. <laughs> <laughs> no good, terrible. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Awful, terrible. The biggest pile of no. <laughs> I don't like this episode. It's boring. It drags on. It, the story makes no sense. Um, they make Crockett dress like a pirate. I don't like anything about it. And it's an insult to Larry so there <laughs> so follow up with it <laughs> and that is my true feelings <laughs> well I would say I could be really hard on this episode and like really get in deep but I would say that I I want to I want to feel like that's because I'm still reeling from us losing Zito and that I'm going to be extra hard on this episode because I just I'm still not taking it right that Larry is gone so that's what you're saying. I'm projecting my feelings of loss about. Yes, yeah. exactly. I'm being harder on this episode than I should be because there's no Larry. And we get Stan and he's in the bug van all by himself. And then he's working with the duo. We have a new name for him. We're going to call him the Musketeers because there's just no Larry. And and I'm just I'm going to be extra hard on this episode for no reason. This is it's OK. We've had an episode like this before where they make some leaps and bounds about something ripped from the headlines. And so I'm going to give it a pass. This wasn't the best episode, but I'm going to give it a pass and say it's okay. We're all recovering. Everyone, we're still in the wake of, of Zito's death. Weird things happen in these times. We'll wait and see what happens next week. John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? So uh, an insult to Larry, I, I would say more of an insult to Cuban revolutionaries. <laughs> Uh, to Cuba in general. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have to think that they're maybe more organized than this. It's just, just terrible. Just couldn't get anything right throughout the entire episode. I mean, I give a little bit of credit to the Vice Juan actually having a fairly decent plan after him. But, uh, like I said in the beginning, it's just they trusted him real easy considering that he just shot at each other. And they just they weren't good at anything they did. <laughs> so it's just uh, not good. Yeah, like I, I feel like this was a a difficult task of taking these guys down. Like it, it, it shouldn't have been this difficult. They weren't very good. They they make them out to be militarily trained, but they can't even hit stuff with bazookas. Like <laughs> like this, this this seemed to be a little more drawn out than it needed to be. They could have had these guys at the beginning. I don't know if it needed to be all that drawn out. I mean, I guess because of the length of the episode, but a lot of the the scenes that would have been important to the episode got skipped. You know, like Dominic said, with how they got into the limo and and stuff like that. And it's like it wouldn't have been very hard for them to just start the episode getting SWAT, taking these guys down from the very beginning. They pretty much from the very beginning knew it was these guys. They had a witness. They had a valet who said, I told him everything about how to rob this guy. They pretty much had all the ammunition they needed. I, I mean, e even the all, whole undercover thing really wasn't wasn't needed. They could have done better. John, I'm not going to disagree with you. Like these revolutionaries or guerrillas or whatever you're going to call them were so unprepared that it felt like one of those episodes where we have like the teenagers, right? Yeah, it was yeah. like definitely... A amateur hour <laughs> <laughs> that, well, no, i'm getting a little tired of the dirty fbi agent or, or the dirty fed i should say that sounded uh, really weird you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> that, that would make a really boring porn right <laughs> the dirty fbi agent <laughs> <laughs> well that's gonna do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed this episode of go with the heat we would love to hear from you email us go with the heat at gmail.com or tweet at us at go with the heat 
We'd love to hear your feedback on this episode. Are we being unfairly hard on this episode because we are still in so much pain of Larry Zito's passing? Email us, goWithTheHeat at gmail.com or tweet at us at GoWithTheHeat. You can also check out the website, GoWithTheHeat.com. You can find all the ways to subscribe. You can find the show notes. Do you want to know more about this music? Do you want to know who the guest stars are? Do you want to actually be able to listen to the music? You can go check out the website, GoWithTheHeat.com. You'll be able to find all the show notes for this episode. That's going to do it for us this week. We really hope Hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat, and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pal.